and what you're going to do because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And we give you praise. Come on, with the people of God this morning, just begin to praise him for who he's been, who he is, and who he's going to be. Praise him that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise him that he's going to be in your situation. Praise him from where he's brought you through. Praise him that he's in the midst of what you're going through right now. Even when you don't see him and you don't feel him, he's right there and he's watching you. Praise him for that. Hallelujah. Because as you come in here and you come in here expecting God to do something in your life, he's going to do that. Have you come in here this morning expecting God to do something? And you're, you're going to be commended to be here on Labor Day weekend because I see a bunch of people who are hungry for God this morning. I see a bunch of people who decided to come to the house of God because they were expecting God to show up in their life. And when you come in expecting, God's going to do something big. Hallelujah. My goodness. What a sweet spirit that's in here right now. My goodness. If you've ever doubted that God <laughs> was real, just walk in here on a Sunday morning. And you know without a shadow of, of a doubt that he is here. That he is working for us. He's fighting for us. He's with us. Amen. You can be seated if you can. If you're able to, I know in the presence of God, it's hard to. It's hard to sit down when you want to just soak. You want to just love on Him. Oh, man. God is so cool. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you know, if you've... Like Ashley mentioned, if, if you're interested in membership for next Sunday, meet after the second service in the cafe. But if you've already signed up for membership, we would like to just talk with you for two minutes in the cafe after this service. So please, if you've si already signed up for membership and you're ready to become a member next Sunday, please make sure that you meet us in the cafe just for a couple of minutes after this service as well. So we can just go over a few instructions. You know, today I want to talk to you about the meantime season. And if there was a title that I could put to this, I would say, in the meantime. Meantime seasons are not always fun. You know, they're kind of like holding patterns. You know, what do I do in the meantime, people always ask, right? And life is full of meantime moments and seasons. Meantime seasons are the periods where we're waiting on what God has for us next, right? But there's more to it than just that. Often we ask that question, what do I do in the meantime? We can even look at meantime seasons as if we did something wrong. Maybe God's not showing me the next thing because he's punishing me. There are various reasons why we go through meantime seasons and various thoughts that we think about. You know, how did I get here? Why am, I, why am I in this holding period? It's kind of like an airplane. How many of you ever been in an airplane where you're getting ready to land, and right before you land, they just keep circling, and you just, you're put in this holding pattern, and you're ready to go. You're trying to connect to your next flight. You don't know if you're going to miss your next flight. It's frustrating because you don't know what's going on, but they're preparing for you to land. And sometimes that can be frustrating going around circles because you know you're trying to get somewhere. And the same thing with meantime seasons. We know we're trying to get somewhere with the Lord. We know we're trying to get somewhere in our lives, but he puts us in these meantime seasons for what? And we're going to talk about what we do in these meantime seasons and what holds us back from getting to the next thing. You know, we think God might be punishing us, and that's sometimes why we can't see what's next or Maybe that's why we didn't get a promotion, or maybe that's why the door didn't open, because I did something wrong. But in the meantime is the most valuable time, because we're preparing, we're learning, we're growing, we're praying, we're getting ready in many capacities, so that when God is ready to show up and give us that burning bush experience, we'll be ready. 
Proverbs 24, 27 says, prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Get prepared, get ready, and then build your house. See, we want to see the house built now. We want to see it all happen now because that's the, that's the sweet stuff. That's the good stuff. That's the beautiful thing that we're trying to get to. But there are certain things that have to take place before we build that house. There are certain things that we have to prepare for. In my family, we've been preparing. We've been in a meantime season as we've been awaiting the arrival of our son who was just born on Thursday. And his name is Jaden Israel Fletcher. I think we may even have a picture somewhere. There he is. Hey, buddy. That is Jaden Israel Fletcher. All right, I'll be seeing you soon, bud. And what's interesting about Jaden is that he, he was born on Thursday, September the 3rd, and he was a post-term baby. Okay, so you can imagine our first two children, they were born early. So even going 40 weeks, you know, full term was a lot for us. But the fact that he went past, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I am in a meantime season, you know. I can't go here and can't go there because I've got to stay with Lauren because if she has the baby, you know, I can't be far away from her. So... Week after week after we're making plans and we're scheduling things, we're thinking, man, we thought the baby would have been here by now. And so many things were going going through our heads and so many tests and so many appointments that we had to meet and we had to be at. And as we passed the time of arrival, he still wasn't there and we just had so many questions. And what we had to do was realize that God's timing is perfect. And when, when he's ready to reveal what's next, he will. And in the meantime, we must remain faithful. Does that mean we don't have tests? Does that mean we don't have appointments? No. Even though we may not like the holding patterns, God places us in them all the time. And what I'm saying is, we as a people of God better start valuing these holding times because God is getting ready to do something big. And it can get frustrating. I mean, I thought by the time the kid arrived, he would have already known his ABCs. It was taking so long. But, you know, God knows best. And one of the main things we must know about the meantime seasons is sometimes God is allowing us to go through as a reminder that we are not in control. We try so hard to control our lives because we know what's coming based on the decisions that we make. We like to control our world, but God shows us so many times that we're not in control, and he is. The great thing about this is if we'll just trust him and acknowledge him, that he is sovereign that he is the one true God and he is in control, then we begin to move forward. But when we try to take over things, that's when we have setbacks. We're never as good as we think that we are. Honestly, I'd rather God take it anyway because he is and has everything and he does it better. I just mess things up anyway, right? I'm not that good. Another one of the main things we need to realize is that in the meantime, it's not a time of punishment, it's a time of preparation. And I can tell you right now, because I've been through it and I've experienced it, even recently, it is not a time of punishment. You think that you did something wrong and you're trying to figure out why God has put you in this transition period. You didn't do anything wrong. God puts everybody in transition periods. He puts everybody in meantime seasons. So don't take it as a punishment. It's a time of preparation. Look at Nehemiah in chapter 2. He gives us a great picture of this very thing. Before rebuilding the walls, what does he do? He goes around and he inspects. His meantime season, of course he wanted to see the walls rebuilt, but his meantime season was going around and inspecting the walls. He was going from place to place. He was looking. He was gathering information. He was taking inventory. And if you're in the meantime season, I hope you're taking inventory this morning of the things in your life. I hope that you're inspecting what needs to be rebuilt. Because maybe that's what God is waiting on. Nobody likes holding periods, but God is always showing and always teaching us so we get ready for something big. And who we're going to talk about this morning is Moses. God was getting ready to do something big in the life of Moses. But there was a meantime season that he had to go through. And let me just say this, because this is an important principle for today. Stop searching for your burning bush experience when God gave you the meantime season. 
You will never be able to see God in the burning bush if you can't see him in the meantime. If you can't value how you got there in the first place, then we're just looking for a short-term fix to feed our ego, make us feel emotionally good because we were elevated, or we got a position, or we got something, and it makes us feel good. And that's oftentimes what we value. And that's really our culture in America, isn't it? We want that short-term fix. We want to feel good now. We want to hurry up and get it now. I mean, my goodness, we can't even go to the grocery store and get our groceries because we can have them delivered at the touch of a button. There are many things that we can have now, right now, and it's even integrated in our culture. But what we have to realize is with God, there's no short-term fix. It's a process, and we have to be able to value that process, value the meantime. Proverbs 13, 12 says, A hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's like a tree of life. So as you're waiting and hoping for something to happen, you can really get bent out of shape. But when it actually happens, there's nothing better. So in the meantime, remain faithful because what is coming is going to be like a tree of life. Do you believe that for your life this morning? Do you believe, believe that God has something that's going to be like a tree of life? I know you're hoping for something. I know you've been waiting for something. I know you've been in the meantime season. It's making your heart sick. And you're waiting on God. But I believe that if you keep remaining faithful to him in that season, that God's going to bring that tree of life experience. There are a few key things that happen in the meantime that you shouldn't run from but embrace. Because when bad things happen, many people want to cut and run. But understand that if you cut and run each time something bad happens, you never learn from that experience, right? So let's turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 2. We're going to see Moses... And what he does, often we always talk about Moses, you know, when he was born and that type of thing. Or we talk about when he goes back to Egypt, back to Pharaoh, and we see the plagues happen and all that. But I want to talk about the meantime, before he even has the burning bush experience. I want to talk about the transition period here in chapter 2. There are just a few short, small things that we can really pass by quickly when we're reading this passage. But... We want to take some principles from it. So let's start in Exodus 2.15. And it says this. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled Pharaoh, went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Okay, so we start off this meantime season after Moses has just killed an Egyptian for beating one of his own people. He does cut and run, but he thinks he's running from something, but he's actually running to something, as we all know. And he sat down by a well, and he must have thought his world was going to end. Can you imagine what was going through his mind? You know, he's living in this palace the whole time, and all of a sudden, everything is totally stripped away. you got to think, man, I, my, my life is over. What am I going to do now? Am I going to even do anything? Should I just sit here and die? Who knows what he was thinking? But the first thing that happens in the meantime is embrace your painful experiences. Moses had a very painful experience where everything was lost because of something that he did. But we have to embrace the painful experiences. We want to run from our painful experiences, but we've got to embrace them. I'm going to tell you why. You have to know that you're, let's, let's start off by this. You know, you're going to have to know you're going to have painful experiences. Okay? Does everyone get that? You are going to have painful experiences. You can't avoid them. You're going to have it. And I don't know if somebody told you that when you get saved, it's all victorious. I don't know if you were taught that nothing goes wrong as long as you're a Christian. Has anybody been taught that? Because that's not true at all, right? Has anybody ever, you know, met one of those, what I like to call rainbow puking unicorns? Everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to be great. When you become a Christian, nothing bad happens. No, it doesn't happen. Yes, there's victory. Yes, there's wins. Yes, there are blessings. Yes, there are great things that God has in store, the best things, better than anything. But we've got to go through a meantime season in order to get there. We've got to go through painful experiences. It's tough. It's messy. It's gritty. And it hurts sometimes, but it does make you stronger. And there's light at the end of the tunnel. Painful experiences can put you in the meantime season or it can be an ongoing thing. 
you may feel like you're in a meantime season, you just keep getting hit. Has anybody ever felt like that? Like, my goodness, I got hit one time. How can, how can the hits just keep on coming? What am I doing wrong? A lot of times those can tell you, you, you can even think that you're being punished because you keep getting hit. What am I doing wrong, Lord? But he's never going to throw something at you that you can't take. In fact, you should be happy and joyful to know that, oh, this is being thrown at me. Man, the Lord must really think, think something of me. He must really believe in me for me to be able to go through this. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's not pretty at all. In fact, it can be an ugly thing that can cause you to want to give up everything. Bad relationships, family members who have passed, job situations gone wrong. Think about Mary and Martha, what they went through when Lazarus died. Thinking that Jesus could do something about it until death. When death happened, then everything stopped. If you would have only been here, you could have saved. But even at the point of death, even after death, at the point of decay, when Jesus stepped onto the scene, a simple command of his word, flesh became alive again. Organs started to move and function again. And no matter what you go through and how painful of an experience that you've had. Jesus is stepping on the scene this morning, and his timing and the things that he he has in his hands will be made alive again. If you're here today and you feel dead inside, Jesus is here to revive you and restore you back. Do you believe that? In fact, there are people sitting here today that have had things that you know God wanted you to do for a long time, and because of a painful experience, it's kept you from doing that very thing. You might think that what was once in you is dead now. But I'm here to prophesy that those things that you hid in your heart years ago are no longer dry bones. Do you receive that for your life? They're no longer dry bones, but flesh is attaching to it. Even now, the Spirit is reviving you. Breath is being put back into your lungs. And I declare that before you walk out of this place today... That what was birthed in you a long time ago will also walk out of here with you because it has legs now. Hallelujah. Because life has been put back into it. Embrace your painful experiences and understand that it was all a part of the process to get you to the promised land. It was all a part of the process to get you to the burning bush. (laughs) We ask questions like, if God loves us, why does he allow this to happen? If God was really fighting for me, why did I lose everything? It's because he loves you. What? What is he preaching? He loves me, and that's why he didn't intervene. Yeah, he loves you because he knows how much you can take. Because he believes in you. Because it may not feel good at the time, but there's purpose in everything in your life. Oh, my goodness. Do you think there is anyone on this earth that cares about you more than God, that wants you to succeed more than God? Proverbs 16.3 says this, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Let me say that again. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. What does that mean? God wants you to succeed. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to succeed. That's why he has you exactly where he wants you. Do you think that God was having a good time watching Job suffer? No, but he allowed it to happen because he knew that he was going to restore back to Job what he had and even more. And in the end, Job would have been stronger than before because God is faithful to do that. Don't fall for the lie that because you didn't have faith, that's why you had a painful experience. You ever had somebody tell you that? Because this person died in your life is because of your lack of faith. Don't believe that lie. Don't fall for that. Don't let people around you lie to you like Job's friend did. That's what what Job's friends did. It's because you weren't ready spiritually. That's why all this happened. While Job is sitting there not cursing God, not blaming God, but sitting there with, with boils all over his body where he had just lost everything and his friends came and said something like that. And even then, he didn't curse the Lord. Don't let people around you lie. God is in control and has all the pieces together. He didn't wake up one day and miss the pieces of your life. 
It's all under control. It all has a great purpose. And all you have to do is embrace it and remain faithful. Did God say that he would take care of you? Did he? Are you sure? Do you believe it? Come on, somebody. Do you believe that God is going to take care of you? Are you sure? (laughs) Well, good. Because Genesis chapter 28, 12 says, Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Let me tell you something. Some of you are looking for things that God has promised to you. And you're wondering where God, why God. But I'm letting you know right now. Even though you might not feel him. You might not see him in the midst of the meantime. He is there because he will not leave you. Until he has done what he has promised to you. And you've got to embrace that. And understand that that is the truth. Did he not promise, then he'll do exactly that. There doesn't have to be any doubt, any regret, any sadness in the meantime. My God is still ready to supply all your needs. As he was last year, as he was when you were born, as he was when this book was written, as he was at the beginning of time, he's fighting for you, he's working for you, and he's ready to bless you in his perfect timing. Everything is working together for those who love the Lord. Have you ever seen the righteous forsaken? We can't pick and choose what we want. He's allowing us to experience all kinds of things because it all works together for a good. So in the meantime, we remain faithful. If we got to pick and choose what we wanted, we'd never learn anything, right? One stormy night, an elderly couple entered the lobby of a small hotel and asked for a room, and the clerk said, we're totally full. And, man, it was storming outside. It was raining. And... uh, All the other hotels in town, there were no rooms. And the clerk said, but I cannot send a fine couple out in the rain. I want you to have my room. And uh, the the elderly couple hesitated, but they said, okay, you know, thank you so much. That's that's such a blessing. And in the morning, they they had a great evening. They had uh, a lot of rest in the room. Woke up, passed by the clerk, and the clerk said, how was your evening? The couple said, it was great. Thank you so much. And uh, the elderly man looked at the clerk and said, you're the kind man who should be managing the best hotel in the U.S. Someday I'll build you one. And the clerk smiled politely. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. A few years later, the clerk received a letter from the elderly man recalling that stormy night and asking him to come to New York. A round-trip ticket was enclosed. When the clerk arrived, his host took him to the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street where stood a magnificent new building. That, explained the man, is the hotel I have built for you to manage. The man was William Waldorf Astor, and the hotel was the original Waldorf Astoria. The young clerk, George C. Bolt, became its first manager. And just as the old man was faithful in doing what he said he would do, my God is faithful to do what he said that he would do. He will build you a new building. He will rebuild your house. He will restore back everything that was stolen from you. And all you have to do is remain faithful. You don't have to figure out the pieces to the puzzle. You don't have to look and try to figure out the details. My God is in control and he has everything taken care of. My God, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. My God, who's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. My God, who has everything that you need. He's the Prince of Peace when you're angry. My goodness, we could go down the list of all that he is. He is everything. He is the answer. And all you have to do is remain faithful. What a God that all he requires us to do is remain faithful. Because he's going to remain faithful to us. He'll bring you out of your painful experiences. All you have to do is allow him in your room. Somebody needs to hear that last part right there. All you need to do is allow him into your room. Don't come to church on Sunday just to visit, but take him with you and invite him into your room. We've got to start getting serious with God again. My goodness, at this day and age... At this day and age, the body of Christ, we should be doing everything possible to get desperate before God. My goodness, when I get a few minutes, I'm going to turn off the TV and I'm just going to spend it with you, God, because I I see the signs of the times. And I want to get close to you. Do you really, 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 really want him? That's the question. 
We say we want him. We sing about how much we want him. But do you really, really, when it gets down to it, down to the heart, down to the core of who you are, and you seriously get serious with this question, do I really want him? Do I really adore him? Do I really want him in my room? Young people, as you're going to school, do you really want him with you as you're walking down the school halls or, or, or are you too embarrassed by him? Does it mean more to you to be popular? Does it mean more to you to be accepted by your friends than to have Jesus walking beside of you? Do we really want him? Man, we could talk about things all day, but the simple question needs to be asked. Do you really want him? And you can't answer that by yes. You answer it by how you live your life. You answer that by if you really invite him in your room. We must come to the realization that without painful experiences, there are no burning bush experiences. Even Jesus, who didn't have to die, did and went through the most painful experience. Do you really believe that God didn't feel emotion when his son died? No father could ever bear to watch that type of suffering. So the next time that we feel like nobody understands, we better think again because God understands better than anybody the experiences that you've gone through. If you don't think that anybody understands your painful experiences in churches that you've been to, well, first of all, I can tell you I can really relate to that. If you've been hurt by a church or hurt by a pastor or hurt by a leader, look at Jesus and the Pharisees, all the religious leaders there in the church, what did they do in all of the Gospels? We're reading about it. They're always nagging him. They're always going after him. Of course he understands. Nobody understands better than God. But there's a remedy for all this. You know what it's called? This is going to be great. Are you ready for it? The joy of the Lord. You see, there has to be a transaction that takes place. We have to turn our painful experiences into something. And we have to trade our sorrows for joy, just like the song says. The joy of the Lord. We can't live off of the pain. We have to go through the pain because that makes us stronger, but we don't live off of the pain. You see the difference. Some of you are living off of the pain, and you need to trade that pain in for the joy Because when you have the joy, it's going to take you through that, and then you're able to move forward closer to the burning bush experience that God has always waited for you to be at. We can't live off of that. We go through it for a reason. But that strength only comes from the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 talks about the joy of the Lord being our strength, and strength in that passage means fortress. That means that when you take on the joy of the Lord, nothing can penetrate you. Think about it. If you want to make the enemy really mad, go ahead and get happy about what he's throwing at you. You ever have siblings? When you're young, me and my brother used to do this all the time. We knew it would bother each other. But, but when he would get mad, I would just smile and laugh, you know, and, and just keep nagging him and keep smiling, keep laughing. And no matter what he would try to do back, I would just laugh like it didn't bother me. And that just irritated him. But, you know, he did the same thing with me. And it makes you so mad, you know, when you see somebody and it's not bothering them, can you imagine if you just had the joy of the Lord and every time something is thrown at you, every time that the enemy comes at you, you're just laughing and you are just making him mad. James 1, 2 through 4, the famous passage that we always use, but it's a great passage because it's something that we should live off of every single day, is consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, right? Perseverance, you're getting stronger, you're being tested, but we're considering it pure joy. That's why we can keep going. Let perseverance finish its work. Some of you haven't let perseverance finish its work. Got to let it finish, okay? You started right. But there's some sitting here, man, I just feel this. There's some sitting here, you didn't let it finish the work. You started out, you really believed, but you didn't let it fully complete. Perseverance finished its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. 
And there, you've just learned something in the meantime season. Lacking nothing, meaning you became complete in the meantime season because you held on to the joy, and now you're ready for the burning bush. You are ready for your defining moment that will change everything. Moses traded his painful experiences for joy. David traded his attacks from Saul into joy. Joseph traded his slavery for joy. Is there a scripture that says that? No, but this is how I know. You ready? You cannot function in the supernatural without the joy of the Lord. How is God going to give you the next if you can't be happy in the meantime? If you can't be happy with what he's already given you, whether you like it or not what he's given you, how in the world can we possibly get the next? How can we possibly be led to the burning bush when we can't even get what we're doing right now right? Why would God want to bring the next to you if you can't even smile when you walk through the doors of the church? I mean, what did we think we were getting ourselves into when we became Christians? Look at all these Bible characters. Look at... Every single one of them went through something. Every single one of them had problems. We had to have known when we became Christians that we were going to go through this kind of stuff. We knew we were going to have trials of many kinds when we decided to do this Christian thing, so we might as well smile along the way and be happy about it. Someone turn to your neighbor and just give them a nice joy of the Lord smile. We might as well smile along the way. Because the reason why I smile is that I know I'm doing something right. If the enemy would take time out to mess with me, what am I doing so well that would cause him to hate me so much enough to go to God and ask permission to throw stuff at me? If he didn't think Job was a threat, he would have gone. He wouldn't have gone to God. So when you go through junk, you smile knowing that the enemy sees you as a threat. And I want him to view me as a threat because I am that. Because we put the devil on notice. I'm coming for my friends. I'm coming for my family. I'm coming to reclaim everything that the enemy stole. And I want him to see that I'm rising up. And I want him to see that I know that I'm blessed. And I want him to see that I'm embracing my identity. And I want him to see that I'm walking to the burning bush. And I want him to see that nothing, nothing, nothing can take me out because I'm going to smile the whole way. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, would you just praise God that you have the authority, you have the power. Woo! My goodness, you have the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and snakes. Oh, my goodness. If the body of Christ could just know who they were in these last days. (laughs) Jesus. Sorry for yelling. You guys can be seated. I can't help it. I get so excited. I get so excited about God. I get... You get so passionate. I, I, <laughs> man, my goodness. God, give us that passion and joy back. Whew. Man, how, it's so good. Good to be a Christian. It's so good to have the opportunity to be faithful. It's so good to love on God. Oh, man, we got to move on. What did we think was going to happen? Did we think that this was going to be all victory until Jesus comes, right? Did we think that we just turned into, like I said, rainbow puking unicorns and ride on a cloud back and forth to work? Ministry is messy. This Christian thing can get ugly. But we love every minute of it because we made a transaction. And it's not a one-time transaction. It's a process. Yeah, I remember last year when I got the joy of the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> and you must have had a bad year. Because I, I want to have the joy of the Lord every single day of my life. 
And the great thing about it is you have access. And there are people that are next to you at work, and they need the joy of the Lord, but they don't even know how to get it. But you have access. There's some family members in your household that need the joy of the Lord. Guess what? You have access. Help someone out. Show them the way. Help them make a transaction. Some of us can't allow joy in our lives because we let unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. We speak death over our situation before it is ended. We complain and speak negative. And I don't know what we're looking for if we're we're trying to get people to feel bad for us enough for someone to fix it for us when there's only one who can do that. There's only one. But if we're too busy speaking death over ourselves, you can forget making it through the meantime because you won't get there. Some of us need to change up our language We're too busy speaking death over our spouses. And we're asking the question, how do we end up here? How do we end up in divorce? We didn't realize the words that were coming out of our mouths. We're busy speaking death over our children as if they were more of a burden than a blessing. You know, we have the power to speak life and death, and we've got to begin to speak life back into our situations. Another thing that holds us back is that we get caught up on so many things that make, make us unhappy that we can't even have joy. The person wore this outfit this morning at church. Someone parked in the spot I always parked in. <laughs> Pastor Josh is wearing tennis shoes while he's preaching. I can't receive, I can't receive. The person posted this about me on Facebook. I guess I'll let it ruin my week. This person's wearing too much makeup. Look at all those earrings. It's all the way up in the cartilage. We get caught up on the small things that we should be shrugging off. Man, those are the things I don't want to deal with. I got bigger things to worry about. I got bigger battles to worry about. Like my children having salvation. My co-workers knowing who Jesus is, helping people make transactions for the joy of the Lord. Those are the things that I don't want to worry about. Those are things that I want to deal with. I don't have time to worry about the little things that people do just because our systems were different growing up. Or just because our systems and our behavior is different in our families. You know, who, who, who am I? What is it to me? You remember when Peter came to Jesus? <laughs> you remember when Peter came to Jesus And he was like, well, what are you going to do with them? He said, what is it to you? You do what I told you to do. What is it to you, whether he lives or dies? And then Peter didn't even get it then. He went and he said, oh, he he said he's going to live forever. Peter, you know, come on. We got to shrug that stuff off. And I'm not saying walk around with a fake smile, with fake joy, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying, okay, we got to put on a show because I've got to have the joy of the Lord. Hey, how are you doing this morning? God bless you. Hey, how are you doing this morning? God bless I'm not saying do that. I'm not saying put on the fake thing. Because if you truly have the joy of the Lord, it's not going to be fake. It's not going to be something you have to wear on the outside. It's going to be something inside that you can't keep inside that's going to come out. And you can try to hold it in, and it'll be like, Woo! The joy of the Lord. You can't contain it. That's how it works. It's totally different than the fake thing. When you tap into the Spirit each day, okay, here it is. Here it is right here. I'm talking about real joy. It's something that's supernatural, okay? It's something you can truly have. If you are not experiencing true joy from the Lord, then you're not having Holy Spirit experiences that is available to you on a daily basis. When you tap into the Spirit each day, in your prayer time, there is something supernatural that happens inside of you. Something is churning there. There's something that wells up inside of you with overwhelming joy, and you know that you could face anything that day. You, you could take on battles. You could take on whatever, and you're like, bring it, devil. Bring it on, buddy. Come on. And you just feel totally different than when you did before. It can even cause you to physically laugh. Have you ever been in his presence and you just began laughing? Huh? Just the joy of the Lord? (laughs) Right? Man, I love that. 
See, some of y'all, some of y'all. <laughs> I know I've heard some of y'all laugh crazy. And I knew it had to be the joy of the Lord because nobody laughs like that, you know, for real. You know, the joy of the Lord. If you want to have this joy to get you through the meantime, then you have to begin having some Holy Spirit experiences separate, separate from Sunday morning where you and God are meeting on a regular basis. We have got to get this concept, folks. As a body of Christ all across the U.S., if we cannot get this, then we will never be able to get out of the meantime season. We have got to meet with God separate from Sunday mornings. This is not a religious ritual that we do. We've got to get that out. We've got to push it out. This is not a ritual. This is an opportunity for us to come together corporately, receive something from God because this is a training facility, and as he pours into us, man, we feel great and awesome, but we don't leave it here. We walk out with things alive in us, like I mentioned before, the things that were dead inside of you are now alive. You walk out there, and then you pour it out outside of these walls. And then whenever you're ready, you come back and you get more. But you don't wait till from Sunday to Sunday. You do it every single day because you're going to need them every single day. As you know, the painful experiences that we go through on a daily basis, we have to tap into that every single day. My goodness. Can we just do that now? Can you just stand to your feet for a second? I don't even know if I'm going to get this whole message preached because we've just been talking about the joy. But can you just lift your hands and you begin to praise God right now? And go ahead and have your little individual Holy Spirit experience for a second. Just go ahead and tap into the Holy Spirit right now and say, I speak joy over myself right now, oh God. Lord, I receive your joy right now, and I speak life back into me in Jesus' name. Go ahead. We can go ahead and practice right now. We don't have to wait till we go home. We can do that right now. Oh, God, would you do something in my life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, that's all you have to do every single day. Just spend a little time with him. Let, and, and God will do the work. You don't have to push for it. Let him do the work. All right. I love the Lord. Let's be seated. Amen. Just for, just for a few more minutes. Well, that was my first point. Um, <laughs> had a couple more. So we'll just, we'll see what happens here, Okay. The second thing is we got to fight our personal battles. First thing is embrace your painful experiences. Second thing is fight your personal battles, or you can coin it as weeding times. Exodus 2, 16 through 17. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to the rescue and watered their flock. Okay, so we see that Moses just fought a battle here to get uh, a group of people out that didn't need to be there. <clears throat> God used Moses to weed out some bad shepherds that were trying to drive out the daughters. Meantime seasons also mean that it's time for us to weed out some things and fight some personal battles with some things that don't need to exist in our lives. We must be careful to not put the blame on others. I blame my boss for not giving me a raise or a promotion. I blame my spouse for the arguments that we have. I blame my parents for my behavior now. So let's start with this right here. What in my life needs to change for me to see the burning bush? What are the things that need to be weeded out before I can grow? It's amazing to me over the years as we have couples come for marriage counseling, almost every single couple is looking for that quick remedy. And they aren't really looking to weed things out. They're not looking to pull the roots out, right? They're just looking to, for, for the quick fix. Most of the time, it's to get us to agree with their viewpoint. And almost every single couple, when they, when they get asked these simple questions that I'm going to give you, they try to bypass it and not give the answers. And these are just simple, basic questions. Here they are. How much do you pray together? How much do you pray for one another? How often do you have devotions together? Is God involved in your decision-making? And almost every time, these are the foundational problems of, of the marriage that nobody wants to deal with. In fact, they want to fight battles, but just not the personal ones. 
the, where they deal with the internal things that both sides have. It's, it's always like he said this or she said this, and really it's, a, it's both. <laughs> Everybody needs to work together. And if we can't manage the simple things that God has already given us, then we will never grow. Quit coming asking for remedies when God is the remedy, right? These are battles that we have to fight against. We have to resist the temptation to act upon our flesh. When we do, we hurt everyone else around us and hurt ourselves. In the meantime, you don't just wait for things to grow. You know, I, I planted my first garden this past year, and there are all kinds of weeds that came up, you know, and after you do that, you know, there's a meantime season after you plant things and you wait. But that doesn't mean you just wait. You know, our meantime seasons don't mean that we just sit there and we wait till Jesus comes. We have to manage our lives. And with the, with the garden, I had to manage things. You know, bugs were eating some of the vegetables, you know, and weeds were growing up and trying to attack the things that I planted. <clears throat> And I had to get out there and, and, and weed. And we complain so much about where we aren't going, what we don't have, when God is wondering why you just don't weed that out because that's what's going to keep you moving forward. And we're waiting on God, and he's waiting on us. Why would he ever give us the promised land when we complain about the manna he gave us, right? No wonder it took 40 years for the Israelites to enter the promised land. Everything was God's fault and Moses' fault. I wonder, I wonder if they would have learned some of the lessons that they needed to learn if it would have taken a lot less time than 40 years. I wonder if it would have taken 20 years. I don't know. But it's something to think about. Why did it take so long? And another thing is that God doesn't let you get to the next thing because you've been burnt out. Even burnout can keep you from getting to the burning bush experience. And in fact, the burning bush would only put more on you. Can you imagine Moses going to the burning bush prematurely? You know, what about a month after he escaped Egypt? He wouldn't have been ready to go back. There were some things that he had to learn along the way. He wouldn't have been able to take it. He needed a meantime. So sometimes you're even burnt out physically. And God's not going to give you the next until you take care of yourself. Let me tell you something that's important that we tell our Bible college students in, in leadership and ministry classes. It's okay to say no. It's okay to rest. It's okay to protect you and your family because if you get burnt out, you know, we're all wanting to advance the kingdom of God, but if you get burnt out physically, what good are you? What good are you going to do for the kingdom of God if you're burnt out physically, right? You've got to rest. You've got to take care. Now, there's another extreme to that where we don't do anything because we're trying to rest, right? <laughs> but there does have to be a balance, but you guys know what I'm saying. Think of it this way. Look at a wick that's placed in oil and then lit. If the oil runs out, the wick burns. As long as there's oil, the wick doesn't burn. As long as we're living in dependence on the Holy Spirit, we don't burn out. Here's the question. What's burning in your life, the Holy Spirit or you? Holy Spirit, or is it you? And if it's you, that's a battle that we have to fight against until we get it right. You may, don't, don't get weary in well-doing, okay? You might be doing everything good, but you might be getting burnt out. Don't let that happen, because you've got to be ready for battle. You've got to be instant in season and out of season. And then the, here's the third thing. Be obedient what, with what you have. Be obedient with what you have, or tending the flock. Look here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Moses tended the flock. Was he being trained from, for a different flock? Obviously. David tended the flock. Think about this. Joseph tended the flock. If you look at some of these characters, a lot of what they were doing before was tending flocks. I think that's significant because they were learning how to manage things and they were also learning how to be responsible for other, uh, you know, they were, they were responsible for sheep, but that was a good step for responsibility for being responsible for people later. But we've got to be able to understand 
that what we're doing, you know, probably tending sheep isn't the most fun thing in the world. It's probably not the most exciting thing in the world, but we have to know that there's a reason why God had him there. You know, some of us can't even see past the backside of a sheep because we're too busy complaining about tending the flock instead of thinking, what, what is God preparing me for? You see? People don't see the shepherds out there with the flocks, and they, they don't see what they're doing behind the scenes, but they're remaining faithful. They're being obedient. Joseph was tending the flock. Moses, David. But think about their obedience. There would have been no David and Goliath if he wasn't obedient with the flock. There would have been no selling into slavery and ultimately in, uh, in Egypt if Joseph had not been obedient with tending the flock. If they hadn't have learned the things that they needed to learn and be obedient with what they were given, then they wouldn't have been able to move forward. And that's really the point. 1 Peter 5, 2, 4 says, Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. How about that? See, he's already letting us know. And if you don't know what's next, here's the best thing you can do. Go back to the first thing that God told you to do and be obedient to that. Some of us want to let go with what he's already asked us to do, and we want to pick up something else. And God, I'm ready for this, I'm ready for this, but I didn't say that you were ready for this. Go back to what I told you before because I'm trying to teach you some things. Yeah, but I learned this and this and this. This over here is... That, that hurts, so I want to push that over here, and I don't want to deal with that because I, I like this over here. No, I want you to deal with that because it hurts, because you're going to be stronger in the end, because when you come over here, there's going to be somebody else that's going to deal with that hurt, and you're going to better minister to them. God has ways to teach us. God has reasons behind everything. Also, many are called, but few are chosen. You wonder why you haven't been chosen for the next thing or haven't seen God open a new door? But it's because many times we weren't faithful in the flock tending season. We've heard people say, have you ever heard people say, I'm not called to do that? You know, when you ask somebody to help you clean the toilets, oh, I'm not called to do that. I wasn't called to clean the toilets. Not called to do that. Was Moses called to tend the flocks or was he called to lead people to the promised land? He was being obedient with what he had until he embraced his calling. Didn't hear a whole lot of amens on that, but that's okay. It's the truth. It was a part of the meantime. See, I'm going to mess up somebody's theology right now. You ready? Some people act like calling and obedience are the same thing. Did you know that there are some things that God asks us to do outside of our calling? He tests our obedience. I can tell you right now that if I cannot go out there and clean a bathroom, then I have no business being a campus pastor. Ever. It's true. I have no business. We're not ever as good as we think that we are. And when God is ready to move us, he will. To whom much is given, much is required. Tending the flock has to do a lot more with obedience than calling. Because we were all asked to go out and tend the flock, weren't we? If we can be obedient with what God has already given us to manage, then maybe, just maybe, we're ready for a burning bush moment. And that's the moment that defines in detail what your calling really means. Then you aren't just called, you're chosen. You're not just called, you're chosen. Then how are we treating people? How are we treating circumstances? Are we treating them the right way or are we allowing what happens to dictate what we do? We can be so reactive in the wrong way sometimes, but when you realize that when things hit you so hard to the point where you can't sleep and you're thinking about everything, then you realize that God is so faithful that he shows up late in the midnight hour and you see God turning things around. And when you have someone who tries to destroy you or hate you and you don't even realize why and you begin to realize how much you're doing for God and you realize that you're being faithful and that's why, in fact, you don't even know all the good that you're doing for God because of all the hate that you're getting. And you realize that everything is coming at you because you're being obedient. 
with what you had. Then you start to understand your purpose in the meantime. And that God had all of this lined up and you begin to rise up and know how blessed that you are. And you stand proud knowing that you're willing to take on anything that comes your way because you were never alone from the beginning. Jesus was there the whole time walking on the water and when you saw him, you invited him into the boat and immediately you got to safety. That's my God. In John chapter six, Jesus was walking on the water and the disciples saw him and they were afraid. He said, it is I, don't be afraid. And the Bible specifically says this. They took him into the boat and immediately they made it to shore. Immediately when Jesus came into the boat. There are some of you who feel like you're at your end. You feel like you're not noticed. You feel like you're giving up. And my God knows that you're at your end. But he knows where your end really is. And he does notice you. And all you have to do is let Jesus get in your boat. You may be afraid of what's next, but all I know is that if you take him in your boat, you will see the shore in his timing. It's all about being obedient and faithful. Mark Hatfield tells of touring Calcutta with Mother Teresa and visiting the so-called house of dying where the sick children are cared for in their last days and where the poor line up by the hundreds to receive medical attention. Watching Mother Teresa minister to these people, feeding and nursing those left by others to die, Hatfield was overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the suffering she and her co-workers faced on a daily basis. How can you bear the load without being crushed by it, he asked. Mother Teresa replied, My dear Senator, I'm not called to be successful. I'm called to be faithful. And today, that's all I'm saying, is if you're in a meantime season, just remain faithful. Just be obedient with what's been given to you. Whatever cards that you've been dealt, Be obedient with that. If you don't know what's next, go back to the last thing that God told you to do and be obedient with that. Be faithful with that. And you're going to see that the meantime season can be one of the most blessed, productive seasons that you've ever been in. We think mentally that the burning bush experiences are the best experiences, but those meantime seasons are golden. For us to be able to learn what God wants us to learn. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Oh, hallelujah. I know for a fact that some of you are in these seasons this morning. And I know you're wondering why, where, who... And there are all kinds of questions in your mind. What is next? What is God doing here? Does he even care about me? Does he even see me? And I want to assure you this morning, this this is word is for you, and you can embrace it this morning, that God cares about you, and he loves you, and nothing can separate you from his love. And he's watching you, And he knows where you are. And the reason why you're in this season is because he has allowed it to happen. Understand that everything is ordained by him. Because he wants you to become stronger. He believes in you. And that's why you're going through it. Put a smile on your face. And consider it pure joy as you tap into the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Knowing that God can take you through a meantime season. And you can be blessed. Hallelujah. So I want to do something different this morning. If you would just raise your hands to the king this morning. We're just going to pray right here, right now. That God would give you the strength that you need for the meantime. Lord, we come to you right now and we thank you and we praise you for who you are, Lord. God, we thank you so much, oh Lord, that you give us the joy that we need to be our strength. God, I declare joy over the people this morning, Lord. Lord, I speak life into them, oh God, right now. Life into their families, life into their marriages, oh God. May the things that were once dead inside of them become alive right now in Jesus' name, God. And as they walk out the doors, oh God, on this Labor Day weekend, Lord Jesus, may they walk out with something different inside of them, oh God. Lord, pour your spirit upon them this morning, Lord. Let them be totally filled up, oh God, 
for the rest of the day so that when tomorrow comes, Lord, they're able to tap in again, Jesus. We must, we must, we must tap in again, Jesus. We cannot go from week to week and expect to be an effective body of Christ, Lord. So I pray that you would give them the time, that you would give them the strength. Oh, God, Lord, I pray that you would make them so uncomfortable, God, that they would not want to do anything else except get into your presence before they do anything else, Lord. And we praise you for that this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you give God praise this morning? And quickly, I, I want to share something. Uh, two minutes. Share something that Pastor wanted me to share with you uh, on the Budapest crisis. We want to give you an opportunity to sow into something that uh, we feel is a dire need. And uh, this is a great opportunity. Pastor Mike will be speaking more on this next week. But there's a humanitarian crisis taking place in Europe even right now. If, for those of you who haven't heard, Syria has been torn by civil war which has killed over 250,000 people and displaced half of its population. Syrians are fleeing in record numbers and trying to make their way to Europe. Some of you may have seen this on the news. Some countries are at a loss to know how to handle this crisis. And this is an opportunity for the church to show love, to rise up. The church has been reluctant, reluctant to go to Islamic nations for fear of death but now Islam is coming to Europe and if the church does not step up with the love of Christ and reach out to those who are extremely vulnerable and at a low point in their lives Islam will overrun Europe pastors Mike and Becky will be leaving for Budapest this month and will be on the ground meeting Syrian refugees and talking with European leaders about this crisis, we want to receive a special offering today to raise money to buy humanitarian supplies and minister in a very practical way to those who are desperately in need. So that way, when they get on the ground, they can they can use that seed right away and be able to minister to people. So we just want to be able to give an opportunity uh, as you leave to be able to give towards that so we can just sow, you know, to help people that are vulnerable, people at a low point, people that are that are walking down the highways, you know, and that really need, this is an opportunity for the church to really step up. And so, as you leave this morning, if you would give towards that need, that would be awesome. And, uh, man, this has been a great day, amen. Have you received something this morning? God is good. Make sure that you pour into somebody else this week. And again, for those of you who have already signed up for membership, please meet me in the cafe for a couple of minutes. Thank you. God bless you. Be blessed on this weekend. Your joy overcomes when the world tries to pull me under. Your joy overcomes. If you would, just go ahead and put those in the plates. We have special plates down here up front, not the boxes. Thank you so much. Oh